Well, welcome to Willowbrook. I'm so glad you've chosen to join us online. You know we are open for on-site services as well, but before you come, make sure you check out the church website right there on the main page. It talks about all the protocols that we follow when you come and join us. We want to make sure that you have an enjoyable time while you're here, so check those out and we'll see you very soon. Hello, Hello Willowbrook Church. We miss you. Hey Willowbrook, miss you guys. God bless.
be the sermon. What does that really mean? Well, that's what we're going to explore today. When someone says, be the sermon, they're meaning let your life be lived in such a way that it reveals what you believe. And that's very important. We need to be the sermon. We need to live what we believe. But some only be the sermon. And sometimes they just be. There's no sermon involved. A sermon is, is something that is spoken as well. It's not just what people observe. They need to know what they are observing. Jesus tackles this in Luke chapter 4. It's a great illustration of this point. I want to, you to turn with me there. We're going to go to verses 40 through 43. And as we look at these verses, understand this is at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. He's just starting off. And he's done some pretty amazing miracles up to this point, And he's doing a few more. So here we are in verse 40. When the sun was setting, all those who had anyone sick with various diseases brought them to him. As he laid his hands on each one of them, he healed them. Also, demons were coming out of many, shouting and saying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Christ. When it was day, he went out and made his way to a deserted place. But the crowds were searching for him. They came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said to them, it is necessary for me to proclaim the good news about the kingdom of God to other towns also, because I was sent for this purpose. You see, Jesus was doing something very unique. He was pointing out his purpose, his mission. It's important for us to recognize that as he's pointing out his purpose and his mission, the people were still bringing the sick and the lame there were still more who needed healing. When you think about the fact that there's still more who needed healing and that Jesus didn't address their healing, it, it almost is bothersome, isn't it? Why didn't Jesus heal the others? Well, Jesus is pointing out that that was just part of his mission. He was healing and performing these miracles to show the kingdom of God and the power of God so that people would trust in God for everything. But that wouldn't get his main purpose through. You see, he came to die for you and he came to die for me. Verse 43 talks about that. He went on to preach in other lands. He wasn't content just to be sequestered into some corner of Galilee and be a, 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 a just a blip on the radar. No, Jesus knew he had to spread this message that he had of life and of, of life eternal, not just of temporal healing, but of eternal life throughout all of Judea. And so we catch in verse 44, where it says, and he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Did you catch that? He didn't just stay in Capernaum. He went throughout all of Judea preaching in the synagogues. And did you catch that before he did any of this, he went off to pray? It's in those moments of prayer that he caught his purpose. It's in those moments of prayer when the mission was, was fortified in his mind. And it was in those moments of prayer that the distractions of the crowd came after him and tried to get him to do their agenda. It happens to all of us, where at some point, someone's going to come and try to get us on their agenda. But we need to pray daily to be on God's agenda and on his timing. That way, we, like Jesus, can stay on purpose and on mission. There are going to be many needs in the world around us all the time. We want to be meeting the needs that God is calling us to meet. We want to be on his timing and his agenda. Let me illustrate this for you just a little bit. In 1982, there was a series of killings that took place up in the Chicago area. What happened was that someone or some group of someones 
decided to take a bottles of extra strength Tylenol and replace the Tylenol cap the capsules inside with cyanide laced capsules and then put them into shelves of stores and had them sold. It was a, a tragic time for Tylenol and Johnson and Johnson Company. You can imagine what happened to their stock when this happened. Up until that point, Tylenol was the most successful painkiller of any brand of painkillers on the market. You know, I'm curious, I, I would venture to say it probably still is today. It had 37% of the market share of the painkillers. It was a force to be reckoned with. It was part of the Fortune 500 companies at the time. But when the Tylenol began to kill people, here's CBS's headline. They opened with, when 12-year-old Mary Kellerman of Elk Grove Village, Illinois, awoke at dawn with cold symptoms, her parents gave her one extra strength Tylenol and sent her back to bed. Little did they know they would wake up at 7 a.m. to find their daughter dying on the bathroom floor. The print media weighed in with equally damaging headlines. Time Magazine's front page, Poison Madness in the Midwest. Newsweek, the Tylenol scare, and the Washington Post headline was Tylenol, killer or cure? You can imagine the PR nightmare that Johnson & Johnson suddenly had on their hands. Its chairman, James Burke, reacted to the negative media coverage uh, by forming a seven-member panel. And this seven-member panel was going to look at two very important questions. How do we protect people and how do we save our product? These two questions they wanted answers for. And this seven person panel remembered walking past a large stone wall with the Johnson and Johnson credo on the front. You see Robert Wood Johnson the former chairman from 1932 to 1963 and a member of the forming family wrote this credo and it says we believe our first responsibility is to the doctors nurses and patients to mothers and fathers and all others who use our product and service in meeting their needs everything we do must be of high quality and then at the end of the credo, at the end, after they talk about the high quality for their customers, it says, our final responsibility is to our shareholders. Johnson & Johnson got it right. They knew their purpose. They knew their mission. They knew why they existed. And that saved them because this was their response. They then went out into the public and told them not to to eat Tylenol, not to take it as medicine. They told the public, please, if you've purchased Tylenol, throw it away. It cost them lots of money in the short term, but saved them and their reputation in the long term. Luke reminds us that Jesus had a purpose and a mission. Nothing could distract him from it. He had a credo. He knew why he existed. And when Jesus knows why he existed, it moved his mission forward. It was one consuming passion that kept him going. And I have to ask myself the question, what is our one consuming passion? What is that thing that we do that keeps us moving forward? You know, I... I think sometimes we do lose what our purpose and our mission is. Why do we have church in the first place? Why am I a pastor in this congregation? These are questions that we need to be asking ourselves from time to time. And if we can't answer those questions quickly and honestly, then we may be off of mission and we may be off of our purpose, why God has put us here. We're not just here to be comfortable in the pews. 
We're here because God has something for us. The three angels' messages in Revelation chapter 14 talk about our purpose for the end times. It's no different than the Great Commission, only it focuses it for the end. These three angels' messages have been around for a long, long time. And they have guided our church for nearly two centuries now, as we have sought to help others be prepared for Christ's soon return. So what is this, this message? It's, it's that the everlasting gospel is still relevant. It still has something to teach us. That's the first angel's message. There is judgment to come and the gospel is still relevant. We need to share with people that Jesus is returning soon. It's that there's a counterfeit religion and that it's doomed. It, it has nothing to offer us. And finally, that God's faithful people will not follow that counterfeit religion, but keep God's commands and the faith of Jesus. God is calling us back to our purpose. God is calling you and me both to our one consuming passion, to be a people about his business, to surrender everything we have to him and to follow wherever he might lead, not to get caught up in well, I, I'm about compassion ministry, or, or no, I'm about public evangelism. The two are meant to work together. They're meant to complement each other. And when we talk about compassion ministries, we're talking about things like, like Acts 9 and, and the food pantry. And, um, and when we, we do community service projects, these are compassion ministries. And when we talk about evangelism, well, we kind of know what that is. That's when we hold meetings or we do Bible studies in someone's home. But the two are not exclusive from each other. The two are meant to work together. How will the people who we do compassion ministry uh, to and we say we're being the sermon know what that sermon's about unless we use the name of Jesus? Unless we share with them the hope that we have found in him. This is the reason that we as a church exist. It is our purpose. It is to be our one consuming passion. Friends, it's easy for us to get off one way or the other. It's easy for us to get comfortable where we are and, and lose track of why God has called us together as a church. But we can take this message from Jesus. Some still needed healing. Why? because Jesus couldn't be distracted from his purpose. There are lots of good things in God's church today that can still distract us from his purpose for us. There are lots of good things that God's church does for others, but they may be a distraction from the purpose he has from us. And the only way we can stay on point, the only way we can keep on mission and on purpose is if we do what Jesus did. And that is seek the Lord. Allow his spirit to move in us. To seek him daily in prayer. To go to his word that tells us a time and time again why his church exists. And as we go to his word, we allow him to lead us. It's a heart of surrender that is on point and on purpose. Won't you decide with me? to make that commitment, to be on point and on purpose, to have that one consuming passion, just like Jesus had, to surrender everything to him and to be and preach his sermon in your life. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have not left us to wander and drift, but have given us a purpose as your people. Lord, I pray that you would guide us and that you would lead us to understand your purpose and how it, it affects and applies to our everyday life. We want to be found in your vineyard working and laboring for you. We want to be ready when you return and we want those around us in our community and in our 
uh, neighborhoods and in our families to also be ready when you return. So Lord, I pray a prayer of commitment now. And I ask that your Holy Spirit would bring revival and renewal to us as your people so that we can have your one consuming passion for our lives. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.